Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. We've got a lot going on in our Gospel this morning. In fact, it's probably the Gospel lesson that most of us almost know by heart. We must assuredly know, of course, John 3.16 onward, for God so loved the world. We even see those things at football games, don't we? People holding up the sign, John 3.16. I've yet to try and figure out what that's got to do with football. But if I thought hard about it, I'd probably come up with something. But today we are introduced to Nicodemus. How many times do we hear about Nicodemus in the Gospel of John? Three times. We hear about Nicodemus three times in John's Gospel, and each time we see a progression. Today is the initial meeting. Nicodemus comes to see Jesus at nighttime. He sneaks through the back door. And the reason he does so, he doesn't want any of his friends, his other Pharisee friends, to know that he visited with Jesus. Because let's face it, the Pharisees don't like Jesus. They don't like his theology. And Jesus, of course, is always teaching the people about God's love for them rather than following prescribed laws that the Pharisees themselves have made up. So they just don't like each other. And yet this Pharisee comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, you must be from God because no one apart from God could do the signs that you do. Now, how does Jesus answer that? It seems kind of strange. It's almost like he goes on a tangent. So I've got to believe there's some other things that maybe Nicodemus talks to him about. I've got to believe that Nicodemus is the one that brings up the question, Jesus, I need to know, how can I get into heaven? Because Jesus begins to talk about exactly that. Very truly, I tell you. 
Very truly, I tell you that unless you are born anothen, or anothen, it depends on how you want to pronounce that word. It's a Greek word. This Greek word means two different things. It can mean being born again. It can also mean being born from above. Nicodemus hears it as being born again. And because of that, his mind starts to go off on that tangent and says, Jesus, how is this possible? I'm a grown man. Am I supposed to climb back in my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus says, how, as a Pharisee, do you not understand these things? I'm talking about being born from above. You see, flesh can only be born of flesh. In other words, that since the fall in the garden, humanity has been sinful, and we have this thing called original sin, and we are all born with it, all of us. That is the sin that has started since that time and has gone forward. And Jesus said, because you are born of the flesh, you also contain the sin of the flesh. What I'm speaking about, he says, is being born of the water and of the Holy Spirit. It is what we have come to know as our baptism. You see, he says that God intercedes in this world. He does what you cannot do. And so God, who has been wanting a relationship with all of his people since before time began, is now giving you that opportunity. And that opportunity is through me, says Jesus. Now the interesting thing is, when Jesus is teaching Nicodemus, and he says, you must be born from above, that the you that he is using is not in the singular form, it is actually in the plural form. In other words, he's saying you as in all. And not just you as in Pharisees, or you as in the Jews, but you as in all people, in all time, and in all places. You see, it doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is, whether you're rich or poor, whether you've been good or not so good, whether you've made all the right choices in life or all the bad decisions. It doesn't matter what your gender is, what your race is. It doesn't matter the country you've been born in or the language you speak. That God says that you all must be born again. That God includes all people and that he invites them to experience this. And we experience this in Jesus Christ, who is indeed our Lord and Savior. Now Nicodemus is having a hard time with this because Nicodemus knows that there are laws that must be followed, and he understands part of this water thing because they undergo a rite of purification. The rite of purification means that there are certain things that if you do, or things that happen to you, you are ritually unclean, and you must then take a ceremonious bath. Has anybody ever studied that, this bathing that happens? Let me tell you something. It's pretty disgusting. <laughs> Here's the thing. They have different pools, if you will, that are carved out in certain places, and not everybody has one of these ceremonious baths in their house. Sometimes it's kind of a communal thing. Here's the thing. That the water that goes in there cannot be drawn from a well. It must have a natural flow. So if you have a nearby spring, good for you. If not, you have to rent, wait for rainwater. Sometimes it only rains a couple times a year in this area. So that means that the water in that ceremonial pool, that pool that you're going to go in to be purified, might have been sitting there for a long time. It may have been used by a lot of people. I would dare say you probably couldn't see the bottom of that pool sometimes. It would be very similar, I think, to well, going to the Ganges River. That is a very sacred river, and a lot of people, a lot of pilgrims go there, and they will immerse themselves in the Ganges River. The Ganges River is an open cesspool. There is more disease and disgusting things in that river, and yet thousands of people will go and bathe in that river to be purified. And there was some similarities to what would happen in the time of Jesus. 
And Jesus said, you're just worried about cleansing the outside. God is worried about cleansing the entirety. That you were born with sin, and even though you immerse yourself in that pool, you might consider yourself ritually pure, but you still are tainted with original sin. And God is intervening in your life. God is coming to you to do what you cannot on your own do. And the first step is to be born from above by means of water and God's Holy Spirit. Well, we kind of understand what that's all about. In fact, if we needed to, we could refer back to Titus, I believe, the third chapter, and it talks about Jesus coming and doing just that. That as we begin a relationship, it begins with the water and God's Word. And most of us, as I explained to the young children a lot of times, is we do that when we're infants. And for most of us, we don't have a say in that matter. I mean, let's face it, at two months old, how many little ones stand up in their cribs and say, Mom, time to be baptized. But most of the time, it's God's Holy Spirit working through mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, uncles, aunts, friends, encouraging baptism to happen. And it is the Holy Spirit that we receive in our baptism. And because we are usually so young, we have no say in that. I always tell people that we have as much to do with our baptism as we did with our own conception and our own birth. And that is exactly this much. We didn't choose to be born, did we? We had no say in that matter, did we? Well, we had just as much say in our baptism as well. It is all by the will of God. And it doesn't matter if you're two days old, two months old, or 90 years old. When we come to this font, it is not of our own will, but rather is by the will of God. It is God's Holy Spirit working through others that brings us to this point. And it is there that we receive the Word of God and His Holy Spirit. It is there that we are called sons and daughters of God. It is there that our relationship with God begins. And it is there that the Holy Spirit begins to work in us so that we might come and grow into our faith. Now this is where it gets interesting. This is where we actually have something to do with it. We can either grow in faith, we can either do as Nicodemus does, question that faith, and God doesn't mind questions, believe it or not. God encourages questions. I encourage questions because then I know people are sincerely looking, people are sincerely wanting to know. They're trying to grow in faith. And one of the ways we do that is by questioning. But we also have this bad habit of just being complacent. We figure, okay, one and done. I'm baptized, I'm saved. Think about it in these terms. A young man was somewhat walking down the side of the road. He was staggering more than he was walking. He had probably had just a little bit too much fun. And as he's weaving in and out, he's weaving in and out between parked cars, and an older gentleman happens to see him, and he notices that he's getting dangerously close to stepping out in the middle of some busy traffic. And finally, he gets to the point where he is just going to end up being, well, road pizza. And so this older man recognizes at the last second that this guy is going to end up dead, and he reaches out and he grabs this young man, pulls him off to the sidewalk, and after he makes sure this young man is okay, he puts him in a taxi and makes sure that he gets home. And the young man from the window of the taxi looks at him and says, you saved my life. And the old man just nodded and let him go on his way. Three months after that, this young man hasn't stopped drinking. In fact, he has been pulled over by the police and he's been given a DUI, and it is his time to go before the judge. And so he enters the courtroom, and he's sitting there at that table, waiting for the judge to come in, and the judge comes in in all of his fine robes, 
and he stands up. And all have to rise when the judge enters. And when the young man looked up, he recognized that judge. It was the old man who had saved him. <clears throat> and so as he stood before that judge, he said, Your Honor, you are the one that saved me. You kept me from dying that day. And this judge looked at him and said, Yes, son, I did. That day, I was your savior. Today, I'm your judge. <laughs> you see, that's the way it is. See, that God allows us this relationship with him, that he brings us as far as he possibly can. And then from that point on, well, then we have some say in it. We can choose to know him as our Lord and Savior and continue to grow in our faith, continue to walk along with him where he leads us, or we can just go our own way. And when we go our own way long enough, well, on Judgment Day, we will know him not as our Savior, but as our judge. You see, that part's up to us. What Jesus wants everyone to know, not only Nicodemus, but all people, not only in those days, but in all times to come, that God so loved the world that he gave his Son so that all might be saved. He then lets Nicodemus know, well, since you are a person who has studied the Torah, you are the ones who do the interpretations, most surely you'll recognize this, that when God was leading the children of Israel in the wilderness, they were acting like a bunch of five-year-olds. God, how far do we have to go? God, are we there yet? God, I'm hungry. God, can we pull over? They were complaining to God about the food that he was providing for them. They were complaining to God about the water that he was providing for them. They complained so much that God said, fine, you don't like it? I'm going to send some visitors. In scripture it says he sent fiery serpents to live among them. And each time somebody was bitten by one of those serpents, they died. Now, Nicodemus knows the rest of the story. You see, God was not happy with these people, and yet these people decided, we must have said or done something really bad. So they went to Moses and said, Moses, please pray to God, intercede for us on our behalf, make this right again, please. And so Moses went to God and did just that. Now, God did not say, well, okay, snakes are gone. Rather, he said to Moses this, cast a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, raise that pole up, and if somebody is bitten by a snake, and if they believe in me, if they believe my word is true, they can look at that serpent, and if they are bitten by a snake, they will not die. <coughs> he didn't take the snakes away, but rather he gave them away. And so Jesus said, just like the serpent that was raised up, so shall the Son of Man be raised up. And so that all who see him and believe in him shall not perish, but they shall live. You see, that is why this Gospel of John was written. So that we might believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. That he came into the world, human and God. And that as he taught about God's kingdom to come, he showed us how it is that we can live our lives, not only here and now, but also in the expectation of being with God forever. And not only that, but then, in obedience to the will of God, our Lord and Savior went to the cross, took the sins of the world upon himself, and then died with those sins. That he made us right again with God. And if we believe that, then we have eternal life. It's too easy, isn't it? I was just watching a documentary last night. It was called The Children of Hitler. And it was very moving because it is the children and the grandchildren of some of the people that did the worst atrocities. In fact, the grandson of one of the commandants of Auschwitz was there in Auschwitz. 
And the moving part about this was there was an entire busload of Jewish students who came there that day. And he stood before them, told him who he was, expressed how sorry he was for what his grandfather had done. And he said that if it was up to me and if I had the power, I would have killed him to spare you. And of course, the man broke down into tears. And these young people, they were in their teenage years, they began to ask him questions, and he tried his best to answer them. And finally, out of this group of people that were there, this old man stood up and said, I must say something. Can I come and see you? And that old man came forward, and he said, I was here. I survived. You are not to blame. You are forgiven. He hugged that man, and they both shed a lot of tears. One person who observed that went on camera and said, that just seemed too easy. That for all these people had gone through for the eight million people who perished in places like this, that just seemed too easy. That this one man could forgive this monstrous atrocity that wiped out his entire family. That he could go up to this, this person who was the grandson of this monster himself and to put his arms around him and say, it is not your fault. You are forgiven. You see, that's the way it is with God. That He has done everything for us. He has paid the price for each and every one of us. That you are forgiven. You are made right with God. It is that easy. Because we have a God who loves us beyond all measure. That we have a God who loves us even at our worst. We have a God who sought you out before you were born, and who wants to have that relationship with you here and now, and in his kingdom for eternity. A woman came to a revival tent meeting, and she sat there throughout the entire process, and she was in tears most of the time. And after everyone had left, she came forward to the preacher, and she said, I want to know God, I want to experience the love of God, but I am not worthy. And the man, this preacher, tried to console her. And then he asked her, well, is there any scripture that you know of that you can hold on to? And she said, the only thing that I know from reading the Bible is that God sent his only forgotten son into the world. The preacher thought for a moment and looked at her, and he was about to correct that portion of scripture for her, but God's Holy Spirit came upon him, and the man looked at her and took his hands in his and said, do you know why God forgot his son? Because he wanted to remember you. You see, that's the God that we have. The God who was willing to give his only son so that he might remember you. That is what Nicodemus came to know. In fact, Nicodemus, the second time we hear about him in the Gospel of John, he is standing face to face with the rest of the Pharisees, and he is saying to the Pharisees, why are you doing this? This is not our way. And the Pharisees simply answer on and say, well, this guy's from Galilee. Nothing good comes from Galilee. Are you a Galilean? And finally, the third time we hear about Nicodemus was when Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked Pilate if they could take the body of Jesus down to bury him. Nicodemus came to help him. And not only did he come to help him, Nicodemus came with a hundred pounds of spices so that they might anoint and prepare the body of Jesus for burial. That amount of spice would only be used for a king. Nicodemus came to know Jesus. 
not as a man, not as a prophet, but as the Son of God, the King of Kings. That visit at nighttime in the shadows, when he came face to face with God, he experienced not only the Word of God, but the love of God. And that love 